Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. It's got to be the best fishing show on YouTube by now, guys, surely. I took a trip recently to Southwest Ireland, the Bearer Peninsula, with my old man, and we were looking to do a bit of rock fishing. And one of the episodes we were looking to do is LRF, light rock fishing, involving stupidly light tackle, toothpick rods, thin line. Now, I'm no expert, but I was hoping to find out more information about this sort of fishing and hopefully give you guys a few tips on what to do. Let's go speak to Paul Harris, who knows a lot more than me. I'm here on the southwest coast of Ireland, the Berra Peninsula. I'm with guide, shore fishing guide, Paul Harris, um, and he's hopefully gonna tell me a bit about LRF. Paul, give us some tips on what to do. Okay, really what we're talking about, there's a, as you can see, a huge array of lures that you can fish for pollock and wrasse with. But what's gone into real fashion over the last few years is the, is the LRF. HRF, but there seems to be confusion with people. What is which? What is LRF? What's HRF? What's LRF? And I suppose the easiest way to describe it, we, we, we look at the rods that we use. Now, this rod is rated from 0.5 gram to 7 gram. Light rock fishing, LRF. And this one then is rated from 7 gram to 28 gram. So that's, should we call it heavier rock fishing, HRF. HRF, I've heard people, some people say it's hard rock fishing which means that you'd have to have soft rock fishing, which doesn't work. So it's really just the lightness of the rods, the sensitivity of the tips. Here, here if you look at the two tips, you can probably just see the, the difference in thickness. That's the HRF rod, that's the LRF rod. And you can see that they're, they're, that one's really light. Great fun fishing. You fish small plastic lures, small rubber lures, and that, that's, the, uh, that's basically the whole idea of it. Now, Paul, I see a very large array of lures here, different colours, different sizes. Just give us a bit of insight of what sizes to use and how to put them on the hook. OK, I suppose that the biggest revolution, the biggest difference that all this fishing has made has been able to fish for species that we normally use bait on. Rass, for instance, which traditionally we've always used crab or ragworm or something like that. Suddenly we're using these, these sort of soft plastics, this sort of thing, you know, the smaller sort of lures, uh, any of these, these are absolutely deadly. And, and what the wrasse is doing is attacking them. You know, it, it, you're suddenly invading its territory. Um, and you, you can use you know, lovely little things like, like this. See the ribs, see the little ribs on that. Uh, and that puts a little vibration in the water as well to act as, as a better attractant. And now the really important thing, I think this is what it's all about. You see these queer shaped hooks, <laughs> odd shaped job is all together. If you're going to go and fish for wrasse in kelp and seaweed and everything like that, the biggest problem is you're going to hook up and lose uh, lose tackle. So you do a thing called Texas rigging and, and basically all you're doing with that is just putting the hook in like so, turn it round, so you're pulling it so that your, your eye of the hook now is there, you just twist it round. And the little sneaky bit now is you measure exactly where that hook comes to. So that comes, the bend of the hook comes to there. So that's where you want to go in with the point. So you push the point through. Out it comes at the end. And there, there's the hook. But that's still no good because that could still catch on weed or something. Now you do what I was always told never to do in all my years in fishing. You actually push the point into the plastic. So now you have a lure that's going up and down and great attraction but the hook point will not catch on the, on the kelp or the seaweed. When a fish takes it, when it grabs it, being very soft plastic, it does that and out pops the hook and you hook your fish. So what, what you're doing is enticing the fish to take you. You're just lifting the lure up and dropping it down. Lift it up, drop it down. And, and I would say 75% of your takes will come as the lure is dropping down and the wrasse comes up and attacks it from the bottom. Um, I mean, just to... Just to simplify things a little bit here, I just put one on just to show. That's the sort of lead you'd, you'd have. I mean, you just sort of put this uh, little soft plastic on to show. But that's the sort of lead that you'd have on. Uh, one little tip that was, that was I was given is just take a little cocktail stick with you and just, just push it in there and just break it off like that. And that's locked that in place. So, so the lead's not sliding up and down on the line and bouncing about. Um, and, and that's basically your, your rig. Obviously, this isn't uh, Texas rigged, as we say, with the hook buried. 
But that's the great idea of, of fishing for the wrasse and everything with your, uh, your HRF LRF rods. You can fish much smaller plastics, much smaller hooks, catch much smaller fish, little dragonets and all sorts of things. But on that sort of rig, believe it or not, and with these sort of rods, I've had rasps to nearly five pound. And I tell you what, that is some fantastic sport and great fun. And I've gone to places where I fish crab and I fish these and these will outfish the crab probably five to one, which I can't believe. <laughs> now, Paul, I've got two reels here, obviously very different, different makes, different sizes. Can you give me a bit of insight as to what line to use and what size reels would be ideal for this sort of fishing? Okay. Uh, oh, look at that. That's, <laughs> my God, that's, a, that's, that's an antique, isn't it? Look at that. I haven't seen one of these I for years. So. Where ever did you get this from? The old man. <laughs> it's part of his vintage tackle, uh, I think. Oh, yeah. All is explained. Okay. So, <laughs> right. That's the sort of size reel you want. Yeah. You, you're only fishing a little rod, a light rod. So you don't want a big, heavy, clunking reel on it. And you're not fishing huge distances out. If you're fishing for Pollock, you'd probably be casting, uh, you know, about sort of 30 yards, 40 yards or so. For the Rath, you know, you'd probably go in 10 yards out. Um, so you don't need to cast a long way. But now that's got mono on it. Now, I love monofilament. Wonderful stuff but for this sort of fishing i would really recommend a braid um, because uh, you've got that extra sensitivity and you need to be able to feel your your lure especially when you're just lifting it up and dropping it down and lifting it up. you need to be in direct contact and braid gives you that lovely direct contact you would attach about sort of uh or about sort of five or six uh, five, about five feet four or five feet of, of mono to your braid to attach to your hook to your lure but the braid is the main part of the thing that you, you get uh, that really nice feeling of. And just in case people think it's, you know, an incredibly expensive way of fishing, it's not. You know, these rods, you can pick these rods up for, like, what, 25, 30 pounds? Yeah. Um, this, this reel, I actually sent for this reel from China, would you believe? And it cost me three pounds. Three pounds. Yeah, <laughs> and about eight pound postage. <laughs> but uh, it actually cost me three pound. I mean, and I've been using that for two years. And it's, it's a fabulous, if you need more lime putting on, so it's a bit lower than that. But it's a fabulous reel. And that's all you need. A small reel, light rod, a selection of these little lures of various colours, kinds, creeds, species. <laughs> you can fish light. You just pick all these little plastic boxes up, put them in your pocket, rod, reel, Landing net, yep. and there you go, you're set for a day's LRF, HRF fishing. <laughs> now Paul, we talked about the lures, the rods, the reels, the technique. What sort of ground will, will, are you likely to be fishing over for this sort of, uh, this sort of technique? Well, the, the, the nature of the ground, uh, the, the fish dictates the nature of the ground. Um, for the LRF and, uh, and, and for the close-in fishing, you, you, you're fishing really rocky ground, weedy ground. Um, I know some guys, now I haven't done it, but I know some people are fishing over sandy ground and catching flatfish oh, on right, them. Yeah. Now, I, I, I haven't done that. I think it sounds brilliant to catch flounder and dabs and even place on these little soft plastic sort of thing. Um, but basically, if we're talking more the sort of you know, the rocky fish, yeah. should we say, than yeah. the rasta pollock. The pollock, um, you, you're casting out a bit further. I mean, you don't have to, you, you can be using these sort of things, you know, sand eel sort of imitations, um, anything really. Um, but you're casting out a bit further then into more open water. But pollock, by their very nature, like to be in kelp and everything as well. That's where you get the best of the fish. And so, so that would probably be, um, once again, using our technique of Texas rigging, yep. you can fish through the kelp with that. Well, Paul, we've talked about the light, the light rods, the light reels. What sort of breaking strain of the line will we be using for this sort of technique? Um, well, although we're fishing, as you say, these very, very light, delicate looking little rods and, and everything, they're powerful. They're strong rods. And if you're fishing for the very small fish, then you can go down to sort of, now I'm not great on these millimetre size and everything, but like, so three pound, four pound breaking strain line. If you're going after the heavier fish, the stronger fish, the wrasse, the pollock, you, you, you've got to step up. Um, these rods will take an awful lot of hammer. You know, I've, I've had pollock three, four, five pound on them. Um, and you've got to use the braid. The braid doesn't really matter. I mean, 15 pound breaking strain braid is so thin that it doesn't make a lot of difference. So I'd, it's around about 15 pound that braid is on there. The mono that I've attached to it is around about uh, eight pound, 10 pound. Mainly as much as anything is, is for that sort of extra bit of rubbing as well. You're in rough ground, so you might be on rocks and round kelp and all that sort of thing. So that's slightly stronger line. 
I tend to use just, just normal sort of uh, mono line, just a nice good abrasive mono line. Some people swear by fluorocarbon. They, they reckon that's the, the way. Um, I haven't found a great, I have tried it. I haven't found a great advantage to it, except that this is about a quarter of the price of fluorocarbon. Um, so I think personal choice there really is to, as to which line would suit you. Now, Paul, I can see all these soft plastic lures here, but I'm taken by this packet here with what seems to be liquid or some sort of oil of fluid in there. Can you tell me just what that what exactly that's for? Right. Um, well, I mean, since this really started, Mike, I suppose the, 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 the Japanese and everything are the real forerunners of this because they've been doing this sort of fishing for years. And so we're slowly seeing products come in sort of... Now, imitation ragworm and everything years ago was rubbish. I mean, <laughs> never caught anything on it. But the new stuff they're bringing in, uh, the soft plastics with these various amino acids and everything on them, certainly are proving to be good. Or sometimes, I mean, in the, in the case of this, actually, it's nothing very scientific, this. This is the fact that soft plastics stick together as well. Yeah. So sometimes it helps to just put a little bit of oil or something in to stop your plastic sticking together and keep them nice and shiny and bright. Um, but there's quite a lot of products out there on the market with these special additives and uh, I haven't tried them myself. I think very much for the LRF. Yeah. Very much for the LRF on the small hooks and, and the tiny bits of bait that you're putting on like that for the smaller fish. I believe they're absolutely deadly. Well worth trying. Right, Paul, I guess the real question is what would be your favourite colours or sized eels that you would use? Well, it's, I suppose if we were talking trout fishing, the great saying of match the hatch is, is the important thing. Um, if, we're, if we're looking at uh, trying to imitate what the fish may be eating, then, I, I mean, my great favourite for, for Pollock is, is the uh, sort of imitation sand eel. Come in a variety of shapes and sizes sort of thing. Um, we've got some over here, look, sort of with the hook already in them. Uh, anything like that, really. They're, they're, they're great. And they come in different colours. And I would say one, one important thing to, to mention on this is that I've had days out fishing when we've been poor, it's been slow, not been catching. And you've changed your lure and all of a sudden, oh, you started catching. And you say, oh, they've come on the feed. It may just be that that was the lure they wanted. So don't stick, you know, don't keep fishing with that all day and say they're not feeding. Chop and change. That one might catch all the fish one day, that one might catch them another. So, so match the hatch sort of thing on, on fish like pollock and bass that are predatory. When we come into um, sort of the inducing the take off, off something like wrasse, you want something that sort of flutters, you want something that's going to invade their space. I, I, I love these sort of things. I must say the, the ribbed ones with, with, with all that on, as we were talking about earlier, that they give off a vibration in the water. And uh, you, know, you imagine a wrasse sitting there in his hole and this suddenly coming down to him. He's not going to be happy. <laughs> you know, the first thing is going to be, ah, yes. <laughs> I'm going to bite you, I'm going to attack you. Um, but uh, it, it, it's very similar to the, um, to the pollock. Chop and change. Yeah. Um, rats are a lot more obliging. They tend to attack anything that goes into their territory. Um, and we've got some great fun things. You can get, look, look at that. <laughs> you can have some great fun things as well. I've got to be honest, never caught anything on that. But I still carry it around with me. And one day, you know, that is going to be the killer lure. I don't know what day it's going to be, but, uh, but you can chop and change. That's the great fun of soft plastics. Um, they come in a lot of colours, a lot of shapes, a lot of sizes, and they're not expensive. You know, a big load of soft plastics wouldn't set you back sort of £15. Yeah. And, and for a, for a, that's for a lot of fishing. If you think if you went out and bought some crab and ragworm, that's probably a day's yes, fishing. Yes, yeah. So, uh, so you can get a great variety, but chop and change. Don't stick with the same one, hoping it's going to happen. Do something to make it happen. Yeah. Well, Paul, we've had some absolutely fantastic fishing with you on this trip on the, uh, the Bearer Peninsula. The weather's been good to us. We've got a, a few hours fishing left with us today before we get the ferry. Do you think you could come with us for a few hours and just show us this technique? Well, Mike, you know, we should never lose any fishing time. I think we've been out every hour of the day so far, so let's go catch some. Right people, before you go out on those rocks, they're slippery, slimy, they're dangerous. It's not the place for the faint hearted. You need a few tips. If you do go on your own and you're an adult, I strongly recommend a lightweight life jacket. Just in case you fall in the water, a little thing like this wraps around your neck, easy to carry, won't inhibit your movements, could save your life. Another important safety thing to take, especially when it's getting dark, small lightweight head torches with adjustable, adjustable straps, a number of different settings on them. Really important, especially if you fall over on the rocks in the dark, the Coast Guard's out looking for you, these are vital. Also, how about a pair of compact binoculars? 
You can stand up on the cliffs, on the rocks, you can look down there, try and, you know, spot some good rock fishing platforms, but remember, they magnify everything. So gaps that you have to jump across might be a bit bigger than you think. However, they are also safety items I feel worth taking. Another important safety item, especially if the Coast Guard's looking for you, very small, very lightweight and very cheap. A whistle, really, really simple. It goes straight in the bag, doesn't take up any space. Again, really important if the Coast Guard or a friend is out looking for you, very important. That's a good idea, but also a good idea on a nice pair of boots. Do not use rubber boots, Wellingtons or anything on the rocks when it rains. Some of those black rocks get very slimy and slippery. I got caught once in the silly for three hours when it rained after I was fishing. Nice pair of leather walking boots or rambler's boots, good treads on the bottom, give you grip. Think safety, good pair of boots. Another important safety factor, especially if you're out all day, is keeping hydrated. You can get one of these small camelback things. They can take up to about two litres of water, I think this one. Small, easy, goes in your bag like that, the tube comes out. You don't have to worry about carrying anything, carrying bottles in your hands, your hands free. Really, really important to stay hydrated, especially in that heat and sunny weather. No big metal flasks for me, it seems. What about these? Woo! Like the look at those, don't we? A nice pair of rubber gardening gloves. Bright orange, easy to find, but this is important, people. Very, very rough and grippy there. Don't get your hands cut on barnacles if you're climbing over the rocks, especially at low tide. About two pounds. Got to be a buy. Got to be a buy. Chuck them in the bag. And also good for picking up peeler crabs as well. Very practical one there. Again, another thing not everyone takes. Very cheap. Small first aid kit. Cuts, grazes, fishing line, fishing hooks, you're bound to get them. This saves you the problem of getting messy. Easy to use. Cheap, small. Again, very important. Finally, probably the most important thing, a mobile phone. You need to let people know where you're going. Take the mobile phone with you. You may not get signal everywhere, but generally with emergency calls, you can, they boost your signal for you. This is vital, guys. They can get GPS points and everything from this, they can find you. You can even put it in receivable, small plastic bags. Whoops. You can even break them as well. Or you can get little Ziploc ones as well. Really, really important. This is a godsend. It's a must, guys. Remember? No fish is worth your life when you're out there rock fishing. If you're kids, youngsters, please go with an adult, go with your parents. If you're an adult, go in twos at least. You need to think safety, enjoy your fishing, enjoy your rock fishing. We certainly do. Come back and tell us all about it here at the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Paul can tailor your rock mark to both your angling requirements and ease of access to a rock fishing spot. Some have a nice foot friendly path, while others can be more demanding. And be prepared to move with the tide, as fishing spots can change by the hour. There's no doubting that the Berra Peninsula is still largely unexplored. Paul has been there for almost 10 years and is still searching out new access points. The breathtaking scenery with its backdrop of mountains and maritime climate means you can get out to fish somewhere, even in any wind direction. Although we only had a couple of hours and a falling tide, Paul still felt there would be a chance of a fish. Just, that's timing, I went to get the camera. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. You know what I said about making sure the clutch is adjusted properly? Yeah. That was on a, like a lure type thing, that wasn't it? Blue, uh, yeah, one of the blue stenting ones. Oh. I'm just having a great time there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not you, but I'm such a light tackle. What fun! Here he is. Just about to come up. Ooh. It's a nice pullet. It'll do. No. Just walk him up onto the rocks. And then we walk down the 
and pick him up. Lovely. Okay, well that was actually just the second cast with this little uh, little blue lure. And uh, as you can see, that was the result. Great fun, great fishing. With Paul getting that nice pollock, I fished away and managed to catch a pollock myself. And remember, with shallow inshore waters, the fish can be returned alive. It's great to see them swim away, but if you want one for dinner, then Paul can get it cooked for you. These light LRF rods actually cast quite a long way, and with that tip sensitivity, you can feel the fish attack those rubber lures. And even with all that snaggy ground, the Texas rig will let you fish close to where the fish live, the ultimate take zone. Totally awesome. LRF is a mobile method of fishing, easy and cheap to do, but don't go out on the rocks alone. And youngsters, always go with adults, your safety is worth more than any fish. Well now you've seen it, LRF in action, light rods, small wheels, thin line, small weights, good fun. Paul, thanks very much, had a great time. That's a pleasure Scrape, been having you here and it's only May so get yourself back here in the autumn. We'll be back I'm sure.